now to close the first half of a trick for you. She was born here and has been moving steadily south ever since. <laughs> VG Lee is the acclaimed author of four novels and a collection of short stories. Her most recent book, Always You Adina, was shortlisted for a Stonewall Award in 2012. In 2013, she won the Lonely, sorry, the Planet London Author of the Year Award. She also contributes humour to the Lady Magazine and has just finished her fifth novel. Please welcome the fabulous VG Lee. <laughs> Follow Carl is to read you a bit about my pussy. <laughs> no, <laughs> they've not been out of the bag in several decades. Um, Uh, out of Diary of a Provincial Lesbian that came out uh, quite some time ago. Um, and just very quickly, the heroine is Margaret, Margaret Charlecott, and, and she's, um, she's a bit of a dull sort of person, and she goes out with Georgie, who's, who's not dull at all, or not in her opinion. And I don't know if any of you have been in long-term relationships and you haven't spotted when your partner's going off you. <laughs> <laughs> making some of you uneasy. <laughs> the partner sat down next and they didn't hold your knee. <laughs> Three years ago did they hold your knee, I <laughs> so, um, so anyway, Georgie, the partner, has gone away to work in Edinburgh and she's frequently going to Edinburgh to work. So it's written in diary form um, and we'll, we'll start on January the 3rd. Georgie away working for a few more days in Edinburgh. I'm woken at 5am by Tilly's plaintive cry. I peer over the edge of the mattress. Tilly, small elderly black cat, is addressing the drawer of our divan bed. Nowadays she thinks this is where I live when I'm upstairs. I pat her head and she starts back as if I've struck her with a rolled newspaper. Although frail, she manages to beat me down the stairs and I have a bird's eye view of her hurrying along the hall and into the kitchen. Feel a pang, because she used to be plump with thick, soft fur. However, she's still an extraordinary cat. She can say hello and good morning, <laughs> or at least she can say mellow and nude morning. <laughs> Were she younger and finer looking, I could have carved out a career for her in cat food advertisements. But as an elderly cat, she might still be able to follow in the late Thora Heard's footsteps, <laughs> advertising stair lifts and stepping bath. <laughs> Small rattled feline disappears into step in bath. Nud Norning is heard of rushing <laughs> water. Jan 6. <coughs> Visit my neighbour Deirdre. She's sitting at her computer, her cat Lord Dudley next to her on the table, sprawled in a cardboard box lid. She back tomorrow, dude? Deirdre asked, her eyes fixed on the computer screen. Yes. You pleased? Very. What you doing later? Cleaning. Fancy going to the cath? No. <laughs> Why not? Cleaning. <laughs> Jan 9th. Yesterday, Georgie got back looking tanned. While out food shopping together in the supermarket, I catch a glimpse of the two of us reflected in the store window and it's rather disconcerting. I mean, we've always looked quite different but suddenly our differences are more marked. Georgie looks as if she might be a celebrity whereas I look like the worst sort of <coughs> Margaret. To be more specific, we're a case of Priya's Brosman, Georgie, going out with the actress Frances de la Tour, <laughs> me. <laughs> yes. I realise Frances de la Tour is an extremely attractive woman. In just about every department, she's more than a match for Piers Brosman. Only physically, and I suppose I'm talking about glamour here, there'd be a disparity. And I'm definitely the Frances de la Tour character, only there's not even a hint of show business about me. 
February the 14th, a splendid day. Not morning, Tilly said. <laughs> Not morning, Tilly, I said. Must watch this. Could become an embarrassing habit. Not morning is becoming second nature to say, while good morning has started to sound like a greeting in a foreign language. <laughs> Post arrives. George's remembered. Open Valentine card. Two ducks sitting next to each other on a squashy red sofa kissing. Words, we'll always be quacking good friends. <laughs> George's Valentine from me is waiting on her desk as it isn't worth posting because in her job she moves around so much. I've opted for two grey kittens playing with a ball of wool. Inside I wrote, Mew, 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 I love you. <laughs> Which may be embarrassing, but I do believe when a relationship is coming up to a ten-year celebration, it pays to work at keeping that romantic spark alive. <laughs> Feb 25th. Met up with Georgie's parents for the evening. Georgie adores them. I'd adore them too if they'd adore me. They quite liked me, but ideally they wanted a much grander partner for their only daughter. I don't mind. Or I didn't mind. My happiness held right up till we all left the restaurant. We stood on the pavement saying our goodbyes, buttoning up coats, kissing cheeks. I said, now don't forget, put aside Saturday, March the 20th. You can stay over, there won't be masses of guests, just friends and family. Georgie's mother looked puzzled. Any particular celebration? Georgie said, don't worry, Ma, nothing definite. But of course it's definite, I said. Can you believe it? And decayed together and still deliriously happy. Ma and Pa, in law, were sending inquiring glances towards Georgie. She shook her head at them and narrowed her eyes. I'll let you know, she said. In silence, we walked to where our car was parked. We drove for nearly an hour before she broke the silence. In a quiet, cold voice, she said, I wish you hadn't gone on like that. Why must you always preempt a situation? I had no answer. I was not aware that I preempted situations. All I'm saying, she continued, is it's not such a great idea making a fuss over one day in the calendar. And anyway, logistically, it's just not going to work out. I kept my tone mild. Georgie, why are you talking to me as if I'm a client and you're expecting a, you're explaining a hitch in a business project? Better than turning everything into bouncing, desperate cheerfulness, she said. With you, life has to be either a joke or a whimper. Feb 27th. Sorry, diary. No bouncing, desperate cheerfulness today. Georgie says she loves me as much as ever, but now it's a different love as deep and long-lasting, but missing out on the excitement. And maybe that will prove all we need to last our lifetime. It only may be. She suggest suggested, and I've agreed, to a trial separation. She'll rent a flat in Edinburgh. It will do us good, she says, to reassess where we're going, where we want to go. Don't be surprised, she adds with a wry smile, if I come hightailing back to you within a fortnight. Feb 29th. Georgie left this morning. Georgie leaves Margaret for a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly a drinker. She met a Neither four. Tilly is enjoying an Indian summer. She loves my wild garden. I watch her make her way through the long grasses and waving stems of meadow buttercups with a look on her little round face of absolute sensory delight. And then she flops and rolls on her back and stares at me from this upside down vantage point with a mad good humour. I go to Deirdre and Martins for the evening. They're taking me through the Star Wars trilogy to cheer me up. <laughs> Deirdre orders three large pizzas because nobody is willing to share. <laughs> Film for the evening, episode six, Return of the Jedi. I ask, how can this be a trilogy when we're already up to number <laughs> seven? <laughs> Deirdre says that would take too long to ask her, answer. Look, Lord Dudley wants to sit on your lap. Lord Dudley wants a piece of my pizza, I say. No, Lord Dudley wants a gas fire on, she says. In July? 
Lord Dudley wants a gas bar on all year round, Deirdre says, looking enviously at Martin's pepperoni, pepperoni pizza, as does Lord Dudley. Martin explodes. Can you all be quiet, he barks, as if addressing an assembly of at least twelve, instead of two women and a silent furry cat. <laughs> However, his bark is worse than his bite, as he gets up, switches the gas bar on for Lord Dudley, and slaps a slice of his pepperoni pizza down on Deirdre's plate. Inside, I'm envious. August 4th. Wake up heavy-headed. Go down to Pete's Tilly, but she's not in her usual place i.e. two steps ahead of me on her way into the kitchen. Find her in the front room, lying on the fleece I left on the sofa the night before. Not morning, Tilly. Grab up. For the first time ever, she doesn't respond. Only her green eyes open slightly. She looks up at me as if I'm far removed and no longer the focus of her cat life. I stand in the kitchen, feeling very much alone. Make myself a mug of tea and sit on the stairs. With the banisters, I keep an eye on Tilly. She seems to be barely breathing. I wish Deirdre was here, but she and Martin have gone to Blue Water. I know that I should get a cab and take Tilly to the vet, but I also know she's near the end. She licks cat milk from my fingers and momentarily I'm hopeful. Then her head drops back as if she's quite exhausted. I whisper in her ear, please wake up Tilly, but she doesn't. At nine o'clock, I try Georgie's old mobile number. Surely she'll want to know that Tilly is ill. <coughs> On the third ring, Georgie answers. Hello, she says. Georgie, it's me, Margaret. There's an infinitesimal pause before she says, Margaret, what's the matter? Does something have to be the matter? And of course it does. I think Tilly's dying. In Georgie's background, someone turns down start the week. Has the vet seen her, Georgie asks. Not recently. Does she seem in any pain? I don't think so, Georgie, <coughs> only worn out. Look, Margaret, Tilly's an elderly cat. You don't need me to tell you your options. She then tells me my options. <laughs> Either get her to the vet or let her die at home with you. There is just the hint of exasperation in her voice. OK, I say. Thank you. You've summed up the situation for me. That's exactly what I needed. Nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you too. Her voice is now formal. I replace the receiver. Hearing Georgie's voice, its disinterest, has been like a hard blow to my chest. As I return to the front room, my body is hunched over as if I'm protecting myself, as if there's no reason left to stand up straight. Sit down next to Tilly. She edges towards me so that she's resting against my thigh and I'm comforted by her. I'm thinking that this is what it's really like to be alone. Not the single woman at a club or dinner party. Not shoving a trolley around the supermarket with no one to ask shall we give green tea a go. No, it's Margaret seeking comfort from her dying cat. If this diary was a modern fairy tale, some woman would arrive, unexpectedly, but nobody came. Georgie did not ring back to see how Tilly was or how I was coping. When Tilly died, I was on my own. August 17th. Deirdre treats me to lunch at the Bittlesey Bay Cafe. We have double egg and chips, white bread and butter twice. We go outside onto the terrace that looks down over the cliffs to the seafront. Our double egg and chips arrive and I announce that I'm going to dip my bread in my egg. Deirdre says profoundly, no matter how busy we get in our lives, we shouldn't let deaths and births pass uncelebrated. Unless you really don't like the person, pet or baby, she adds. <laughs> I had a real spot for your Tilly. She stares dreamily out to sea where a, smiley a small white-sailed yacht is tacking across our field of vision. Suddenly she says, Do you believe in messages coming through from the dead? I reply cautiously. I haven't personally received any, Deirdre. I'll tell you something. She squeezes my arm. Now, don't be affronted that this happened to me and not you. I insist I wouldn't dream of being affronted. Yesterday morning, there was a strange smell of sea and flowers in our lounge. Nothing fishy, but sort of perfumed and otherworldly. 
I'm 99% sure that it was your Tilly telling me to tell you that she's absolutely fine where she is. I am affronted. Why should my cat choose to haunt Deidre's now? <laughs> Why should the messages to be passed on to me? <laughs> ah well, Deidre says, get them out. I take the cardboard box of Tilly's ashes from my rucksack. Say hesitantly, Deirdre, the terrace is rather crowded for chucking ashes hither and thither. <laughs> she grabs the box. Don't be ridiculous. She turns to the crowded table on the other side of us. You won't mind if we scatter my friend's cat's ashes, will you? <laughs> the woman with stiff grey perm replies, As long as you're careful, we don't want ash flying back over our salads. <laughs> of course we'll be careful. These ashes mean a lot to my friend. We want them nestling in Mother Earth, not on your lettuce and tomatoes. I can't help starting to shudder with laughter. At that moment, I really admire Deirdre. Get to my feet. Lick my index finger and test the wind's direction. It is in our favour. What should we say, Deirdre asks. Oh... I think good morning, Tilly. <laughs> oh, you and your talking cat. Oh, very well. We toss the ashes out over the balustrade. They fly forward in a fine grey shower. Good morning, Tilly, we say together. And then we shout, we bellow, Good morning, Tilly! <laughs> so that many feet below us, down on the beach, people look up and start waving. <laughs> we wave back. Thank you. <laughs>